time, Jerry is going to introduce your speaker. Jerry Monga. Thank you. Imagine voter fraud in Santa Clara County. <laughs> Hard to grasp, isn't it? I think it's appropriate to have here on May 1st, International Workers' Day, a self-proclaimed red diaper baby, David Horowitz. <laughs> David has made a remarkable journey from advocating Marxism in college and also as editor in the 1990s of Rampart Magazine, a very radical magazine at that time. <coughs> and he's gone from that to being a major leader in the fight against tyranny in every... Uh, Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyway, today he is a major leader in the fight against Terry. I think he's probably best known for his frequent contentious visits on college campuses where he fights for true academic freedom and exposes the real nature of self-proclaimed peace-loving groups like the Muslim Student Association and the Council on American Islamic Relations. You ought to go to uh, on check out his YouTube uh, sessions uh, at UC San Diego and other universities to see how he uh, puts these people to shame as they should be. Anyway, he's authored numerous books, including the book that's available for you to purchase and to have autographed by him, A Point in Time, The Search for Redemption in This Life and Next. David's topic tonight is the art of political war and the radical assault on America and how to fight it. Now, uh, Howard said we have a free book, uh, compliments of Mr. Horowitz, but we also have, for a fee of $3, a book that he has written in 2002, which gave uh, suggestions on how to win the elections in 2004. And Bush, one, 2004, so you must have read this book several times. <laughs> and we have a deal for you, three dollars. Bruce is over there waving his hands, and he's got the books. So after the conclusion of, the, uh, of, the, of this event, please go over there and purchase the book. Meanwhile, I want you to welcome Mr. Horowitz, who's going to give us a very good talk. Thank you. Conservative Forum, and I'm really glad to see it's grown. It was a much smaller organization when I spoke here five years ago. Well, I didn't speak here, but uh, on the peninsula five years ago. Uh, and I think that's vital. And I can just tell you, as somebody, uh, I was raised by communists and uh, know the left pretty well, that the biggest advantage they have is they have a grassroots radical movement. It's also a disadvantage, as you will see today. I, every time they <clears throat> cause a ruckus, um, um, these Occupy people, um, it gladdens my heart because it exposes the Democratic Party, which is a supporter of these people. It's kind of <clears throat> it's interesting that somebody chose May 1st, the communist holiday, um, for my speech here. <laughs> I actually marched at my first um, May Day parade in 1948, which is 64 years ago. Um, I don't applaud that. <laughs> it's organized by the Communist Party. Uh, <clears throat> a man was in a uh, hot air balloon on his way to meet a friend when he realized that he was an hour late. And he didn't really know where he was. He didn't know what his location was, and he didn't know which way the winds were carrying him. So he looked down on the ground and he saw a woman there, and adjusted the flame, and lowered himself to where he, he was within earshot. He leaned out of his basket and said, Excuse me, ma'am, but I promised my friend I'd meet him an hour ago. Um, and I 
I think I'm lost. I don't know where I am, and I don't know where the winds are taking me. Can you help me? Dabit Amin said, sure. You're in a hot air balloon. You're 40 <laughs> feet above the Earth's surface. You're somewhere between 39 and 40 degrees north latitude and 69 and 70 degrees west longitude. Looks down at her and says, are you a Republican? <laughs> he says, yeah, how'd you know? He says, well, the information you've given me sounds like it might be factually correct, but I don't know what it means. I have the foggiest idea what to do with it. My friend is still waiting for me. I'm still late. And frankly, you haven't been any help. She looks up at him and says, you're a Democrat, aren't you? <laughs> said, yeah, how do you know? said, well, you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you are. You've risen to your present height on a large quantity of hot air. You made promises you have no idea how to keep, and you expect me to solve your problems. <laughs> You're in the same position you were when I met you, and yet you managed to blame me for your problems. <laughs> and we all laugh at this, but the joke is on us. Because, <clears throat> you know, when it comes to policy, when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to morals, which you can't really use in the same sentence with the left, um, they're bankrupt. But when it comes to po politics, that is to fighting the political battle, they're brilliant. And we are way, way behind. When I see a Republican square off against a Democrat, it often looks to me like Godzilla versus Bambi. <laughs> I mean, look at it. I mean, they, they know how to frame an indictment. They're, they're always indicting everybody. But it puts everybody on the defensive. They call us, what do they call us? They call us racist, sexist, homophobes, Islamophobes, women haters. And what do we call them? Liberals. <laughs> Don't call them liberals. What are they liberal about except sex, hard drugs, and spending other people's money? The reality is that there's a difference there between people on the left and people on the right. It's not the same people making different pragmatic decisions about what would work. They could care less what would work. We watched Nancy Pelosi and said, well, you know, first we did Social Security, and I'm saying bankrupt. Then we did Medicare, bankrupt. Now we're going to do Obamacare. We're, we'll triple down on the bankruptcy. But they see this as the bringing about of a new millennium. To them, it makes them the army of the saints. That's the way they see themselves. These are the good people, and we're the bad people. Republicans learn their politics in Rotary Clubs, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Rotary Clubs, Chambers of Commerce. And when they go into politics, they do it to get government out of the, the hair of the creative part of our society. Democrats go to, I went to commie camp. I mean, they go to commie, it's socialist camps. <laughs> they join trade unions, which are the government trade unions, which are the, exactly the same thing. And they join apocalyptic crusades to save the planet, which is exactly the same thing. And when they go to Washington or to Sacramento, they do so to change the world. Our people are pragmatic people. We're looking at real problems and trying to solve them. These are religious fanatics. You'd see a liberal, never use that word, you see a leftist posing as a liberal or a progressive. That's what my parents, by the way, and all the time I lived with them, I never heard them use the word communist to refer to themselves, even though they were both card-carrying members of the party. <laughs> Always referred to themselves as progressives. And my mother was a registered Democrat. Not, not much changes. You get older, you know. it's very familiar. 
What is it that the left understands about politics that we don't? Well, we're hamstrung because we are, as I say, pragmatic. We're this world oriented. What does it mean to be a conservative? You look at the past, you see what worked and what didn't work. You see how people are. You understand they have limits, that, they, that, that people can't change their, their skin and their, you know, their way of thinking in any dramatic way. You, read, you can read the Bible, which was written 3,000 years ago. Yeah, those are familiar stories. The people in it, you, you recognize the people in it. Things don't change. People on the left are focused. They don't look at the past. They just write it off. They just, you know, what, what did Ruth Bader Ginsburg say about the Constitution, our Constitution? It's, it's old fashioned. Let's use South Africa's Constitution. <laughs> what an attitude. She's a Supreme Court justice. Our job is to interpret the Constitution. That's what a bad state. We have three communists on the Supreme Court. I wish people would use that word. Because that's who they are. They're communists. They, you know, I, I, I read these, they attack the bad corporations, the evil system, American imperialism. It's exactly what I used to read in the Daily Worker, which was the party's newspaper when I was a kid. But the, Demo but the leftists understand that politics, it's, first of all, it's about sound bites. Second of all, it's about emotions. You don't have to watch the debates on television too much to understand that, first of all, these are very complicated issues that have to be decided politically, and the people who are talking about them are mainly talking through their hats. There's this, uh, women earn 80% of what men do on the dollar. It used to be 70%. Well, how do they get in the end of all the women? Doesn't matter how much job experience you have, how much education, what kind of job you've sought for yourself, how much time you continuously spend in the labor force. Just add up all the women and divide it by the number of the men, and that's how you get it. Well, just think about it. If women actually earned 80 cents on the dollar for exactly the same work and skill level that a man has, then even a half-witted capitalist would fire all his male employees, hire women, and increase his profits 20%. Yeah, you hear the president of the United States, not just the president, the idiot vice president, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and so forth and so on. They all say it. That's what politics is about. But for the left, it's always about us and them. It's about the the poor, the vulnerable, the helpless, the voiceless, the powerless, the weak, against them, which is us, the powerful, the strong, the oppressor. That's the way, that's the argument always goes that way. And when they argue against Republicans, all right, you know, I would say conservatives too, because our mindset, the mind, you know, conservatives are people who are in the private sector. You, you, you may not run a company, uh, but you, you, you understand you probably have to manage somebody else, or have had to. You understand the difficulties in that. You um, and think about it. So when conservatives uh, think politically, they're like accountants. It's all about administration. This is wasteful. That's too much money spent. We're going into debt. Everybody who understands why that's a problem is already voting Republican. It's, it's the others that we have to worry about. So, it always amazes me that Republicans' jaws drop every time a, a Democrat uh, comes at them and attacks them. We have a five, right, it was Obama, he's increased our debt five trillion dollars. How much is five trillion, how much is a, a trillion dollars? Well, <clears throat> LeBron James <laughs> is the highest paid basketball player in the country. He makes $40 million a year. How long do you think it would take uh, Le LeBron James earning $40 million a year to earn a trillion dollars? 25,000 years. That's how much this guy has put us in the Democrats. Put, and they want to put us in more debt. But how are they running this next election? You know, we're going to, what, uh, 
cut the student loan fees and uh, the interest will let them go free. And um, so who's going to pay for that? <laughs> Everybody in this room. However, you can't fight the argument. Let's spend more money on education, on health care, and so forth by just saying it's, it's wasteful. You can't do it. Then you look, what? You look selfish. Notice what the Democrats and the left have. They always have a victim. You're hurting poor people. You're hurting the children. You're hurting the women. Always. There's never a Democrat argument that doesn't include that. You hear this moron, Debbie Wasserman, Schultz, go on and, we care. We care. You guys don't care. You have to answer that argument. You can't just say it's wasteful. Oh, Republicans do have a victim. It's the taxpayer. But what's the counter argument to that? Oh, so you're defending selfish taxpayers who don't want to pay a little more to help the little kids, to help the women. You cannot fight this battle that way. You have to fight it by showing and arguing and never letting people forget Government programs destroy people. For example, we've, we're all, probably everybody in this room is suffering somewhat or other, unless you're incredibly fortunate or have owned your home for a hundred years or something, from the subprime prime mortgage crisis and the collapse of the housing values. Again, when, you know, Republicans are very good. Conservatives are very good. They, it was Bill Clinton and Barney Frank and uh, Barack Obama and, and all their uh, leftist friends in the Democratic Party, which is a, a left-wing party and should only be referred to as such. It's a socialist party. Um, they attacked the banks uh, for being racist because not enough black people owned homes. The basic argument. Um, and of course, it's every American's right to own a home, uh, whether you can afford it or not. So we will just um, throw overboard uh, the lending standards and we'll lend money to people who obviously can never pay it back. This is cuckoo. What person in his right mind could listen to this with a straight face and not? Could, conclude that the person proposing it is nuts. Yet, this all went through. I mean, there was, there was Republican opposition. It wasn't a, nearly enough. Nearly enough. I mean, this should have been a political war of nuclear magnitude to destroy the housing market this way and undermine the whole financial system. But again, when Republicans talk about it, okay, so it, it, was, it was wasteful. It was economically didn't make sense. Who are the victims? Why don't Republicans have the victims? Who's the first line? I mean, of course, everybody suffered from this. But who's the first line of victims? It's all those poor people, all those black poor people who were snookered into buying homes that they could not afford and lost them. How traumatic is it to lose your home? The American dream. They sold you, I mean, they are snake oil salesmen, these, these Democrats. But that's only the tip of that iceberg. Because if you are rising, if you are economically rising, what is your chief investment? It's your home. Black America has the, one of the great success stories that you never hear of the rise of the black middle class. In 1939, something like 4% of blacks were professionals. Now more than half black America is in the middle class. And lots of them, like LeBron James, are really wealthy. <laughs> the collapse of housing values cost Black America, 
54% of its net worth. Where, where's the Republican that's saying that? A hundred billion dollars was lost by middle class, middle class black Americans. That was their reward for working hard, for keeping families together and getting out and getting home. It's that easy. It's that easy, but you have to change your mentality to argue that. Look at the schools. I mean, everybody who comes from an immigrant background, which is probably everybody, knows that that school system, the public school system, was the greatest gift to poor people when they came to this country. You went to school, you got an education, and then you rose in America's opportunity society. You know, I haven't kept up with the statistics, but I know they haven't changed. I remember this newspaper article in the LA Times about the LA school system. Uh, the school district had made one right, one right decision, which was to end social promotion. And what's social promotion in the schools? It's when you, you lie to the kids who have learned nothing and tell them they've learned something and send them on to the next grade and you lie to their parents. And they don't find out until they graduate functionally illiterate and can't get a job. It's one of the most diabolical things that, that progressives have done. Anyway, the article in the LA Times was <clears throat> that they couldn't, and even though that they had an order to end social promotion, they couldn't do it. Because when they calculated the number of children They'd have to hold back. It was half the school system. 350,000 children. They didn't have enough rooms for it. Didn't have enough rooms. That's social atrocity. It's social atrocity. Okay. Look at the inner cities of America. The Chicago, Detroit, South Central, the Oakland. Um, Philadelphia, Cleveland, just go on and on. St. Louis, every single one of them, every city council in every one of them, every school board, every school district is 100% controlled by the Democratic Party and has been run by progressives for 100 years. Everything that's wrong with these school systems, everything that's wrong with the inner city, the policy can affect Democrats and progressives are responsible for. The Democratic Party is a racist party with its boot heels on the necks of poor black and Hispanic children whose lives and life chances it is crushing daily. No, no, no. Where's the Republican who says that? Why isn't that front and center? It's not just rhinos. Conservatives, but look. I've been saying this now for 10 years or more. I'm, that book um, that was held up, How to Beat the Democrats, is in there. I heard one Republican say it, but it was Tom DeLay, and he was on a radio show, and he knew that I was listening, because <laughs> I, I was the next guest. And that's the only time, I swear, I have ever heard a, a Republican say anything like that, or a conservative. In a lot of conservative talk shows, one thing you know about the Democratic Party, and that's why yeah, this Tea Party movement is the most important thing that's happened to conservatism in my lifetime. They have a movement on the left that pushes the Democratic Party left. We don't have such a movement. We now have one in the Tea Party. But this, hasn't, this is not on the Tea Party agenda. If our radio talk show hosts, if our Tea Party activists were saying this all the time, pointing out how Democrats are racists, destroying the lives of poor black and Hispanic children, which they are, it's just a fact, things would begin to change in the Republican Party. You can't just, comp the guys who, the elected politicians always have their fingers in the air. It's the nature of the beast. 
A, Demo a, a congressional district is now something like 750,000 people. That, do you know how many different points of view there are? If, if you're going to get elected, that you have to pull in different constituencies. So of course they're pushed and they're pulled, and they're always trying to say, uh, you know, not to reveal what they actually think, so people will think that they think like them. <laughs> that's what politicians are, and that's why a grassroots movement like this one is so important. This is why you should get activists. This is what you you, you need to be. You need to be doing. And you can go, look, the student loan crime. How, how come tuition? I just was at two. I spoke at, uh, at Bucknell and DePaul. Kids pay fifty fifty six thousand dollars a year to be, in, you know, brainwashed by Occupy Wall Street types. That's that's who their professors are in the liberal arts schools. Why is it so expensive? You look at the charts. The inflation of, of tuition is like three or four times gas prices. Three or four times. Why is that? It's really simple. The government is guaranteeing that no matter how high they raise the tuition, there'll be loans to the kids so they can go to school. Now they're complaining because they can't pay. So who's screwed the students? The Democrats have. So the main thing is to understand that politics is about emotions. It's about sound bites. You can't have a long uh, explanation uh, or argument. Um, and it's about the underdog versus their oppressors, the 1%. I love that they picked it 1% because it's so ridic it's ridiculous. Like everything they say now, maybe I'm just getting too old. <laughs> but every time they open their mouth, they say something incredibly stupid. Like the one percent. Did you did you notice? You know who Elizabeth Warren is. She's running for Scott Scott Brown seat in in, in left wing Massachusetts. Well, it's been revealed that she's not. You know, she got her her university position by claiming to be a Native American. Which, when they asked her what the evidence was, she said family lore. <laughs> She claims to be a, the spokesperson for the 99%. Her income is a million dollars a year. She's, her net worth is four and a half million. When they asked her how she could describe herself as middle class, she said middle class is the state of mind. <laughs> well, you've got to, every time you're advancing a policy position, Every time there's an issue, think of a victim and think of one of their victims. This is war. That's what politics is. It's war conducted by other means. That's how they see it. That's how they fight it. They don't set out to refute the opposition. They set out to destroy anybody who's an articulate spokesperson for our side. The way to combat them is always look for their victims among their victims. Blacks, Hispanics, women, children. It's very easy if you put your mind to it. That's the way, anyway, that's the basic model, the basic uh, strategy. The second thing is that Republicans are too damn, nah, it's just not, it's conservatives. It's a, too civilized. Decent people. So we'll sit there and wait for the other person to finish. <laughs> These leftists will just, progressives will just jump in and jump all over you. Why? Because they see themselves as the army of the saints. They are bringing about a new world. They are religious fanatics who believe that their role is that of I call them social redeemers, saviors, actually. That's what, how they think of themselves. And, and therefore, what do they see you as? The party of Satan. Why, why should they respect your opinion, your right to speak? You are standing in the way of all these wonderful things that are going to happen. 
That's why you have to show them that what they do is very destructive. They have done terrible things, terrible things, to the most vulnerable people in our society, and of course to everyone else. They're the ones who saddled us with this debt of 35 years when they controlled the Congress. And unfortunately, our guys and gals have not been strong enough in opposing this and reversing it. But the only way, again, if you're just talking dollars and cents, you're going to lose the argument. You're just going to be portrayed as somebody who's against education, against the health care for women, and so forth. You have to show them, of course, that these government health care programs, well, that's why I thought Sarah Palin's the death panels was, was brilliant. That's exactly right. <laughs> and they scream when you hit them, and you and, and you you actually hit them. It's, it's a lot of fun because they really scream. <laughs> they can't handle, they can't handle it. Our guys are used to uh, you know taking the hits, but they aren't. The second thing is, as I say, conservatives. They're well brought up, have good breeding, very polite. You know, uh, maybe Republicans don't mention, or conservatives don't mention, all these little kids whose lives are being ruined every day by progressives because it's so horrible. It's, you know, it's impolite to bring up really horrible things in conversations. But the fact of the matter is we do not attack them the way they deserve to be attacked. Barack Obama not only surrendered Iraq to the Iranians, but he was absent when it happened. They had negotiated. We, what, we needed a military base there and a military presence to prevent Ahmadinejad and the Iranian Nazis from taking over Iraq. And he, he, he never participated in the discussions because he wanted to surrender, because Barack Obama is a Marxist radical who wants to bankrupt this country and wants us to lose whatever wars we're in. That's the reality. In that little booklet back there, it's called Barack Obama's Rules for Revolution. It is my, whatever that was, 64 years of experience and studying and knowing the left applied to Barack Obama in a little booklet. And we have we've sold and distributed two and a half million of those. And I, I hope that all of you will take one and and distribute it to uh, I don't know maybe, uh, I'll make it as cheap as you can afford if you, you know, buy a hundred and just give them out to people. Barack Obama betrayed, betrayed every American and every Iraqi who sacrificed their life, their bodies, um, and of course all the money that we put in. He just threw it away. Yeah. Where's the Republican saying that? And that goes back to what happened in the Iraq war. Whatever you think about the Iraq war, this is what happened. When George Bush took on Saddam Hussein over, it was over a broken truce that Saddam Hussein had signed in the first Gulf War. And it involved, of course, the inspections. And George Bush gave, it, it was in June of 2002 that he told Saddam Hussein that he better obey it was time to obey the terms of the truce he had signed. And my belief is that once you do that, you have to follow through on it. But here's what happened. And Bush went to the Security Council, got a 15 to nothing vote, and he went to the Congress. The Democratic leadership, not, not the degenerate communist Teddy Kennedy, he opposed this, and Barack Obama did too. He got the leadership of the Democratic Party, Kerry and Hillary uh, and Feinstein, to sign on 
they signed an, uh, uh, an authorization act for the use of force in Iraq. The majority, actually, of the Democratic Senate signed this. And Kerry, and uh, you can read the speeches, Kerry and Hillary, they made eloquent speeches and gore of why Saddam Hussein was an absolute menace and had to be taken down by force. And it wasn't just them. Bill Clinton signed the Iraqi Liberation Act in 1998 calling for the violent removal of Saddam Hussein. So whenever you think about that decision, the Democrats signed on to it. And then, within three months, three months of the toppling of Saddam Hussein, in June 2003, they turned 180 degrees against the war they had authorized. They sent American youth into harm's way to get killed and then betrayed them. They conducted a psychological warfare campaign. You can read psychological war manuals. And it will say the first thing you do is destroy the moral character of the opposing commander. That was Bush. Bush lied. Why did they say Bush lied, people died? Because the Democrats couldn't tell the truth about why they changed their minds. And what was the truth? There was a Democratic presidential primary at that time, and Howard Dean was getting 45% of the vote in the polls. That's why Kerry and Edwards and the Democrats changed their votes. How despicable is that? On a matter of war and peace, and that's why I, despite all my disagreements with Joe Lieberman, this is an American hero. He sacrificed his presidential ambitions on a matter of principle and a matter of war and peace, where these other wretched people sold out their country and sold it. And, and what did the Bush White House say? Nothing. And it's not just Bush. It's, it's, it's the mentality. It's a mentality of all the Republican consultants and the Republican Party. We've got to change that. We have to not, and I will tell you, I mean, one of the great pleasures of being on college campuses is to meet our young conservatives who have been already called every name in the book. The conservatives are brought up to, to understand that your reputation is your most important of asset. You don't want to get into a pissing contest with a scum. You don't want to smell it. These are all good principles for a civilized culture. They are terrible principles in a political battle. And so older conservatives, oh, and we're probably seen all the time, they kind of wince when people call them names. They don't snap back, and Coulter snaps back. But she's one of the only ones. You can't intimidate her. You can't win a war if you can be intimidated. And politics is a war. When I go out on these campuses and I, I'm organizing 100 Islamic apartheid conferences to stick Islam with what it deserves. Islam is an apartheid society. The greatest oppression of women in the world is conducted by Muslims. Campuses. Now, I do take a bodyguard. Um, that's Ann Coulter's bodyguard. <laughs> but I leave. But those kids stay there. We are a growing a generation of conservatives on our campuses who are very courageous, who have stood up, and who will not be intimidated. And to me, that and the Tea Party are the brightest notes for our future. And since somebody's going to ask me this, yes. I think we're going to win this election. <laughs> I will entertain questions. Okay. We have some, uh, we'll have some cards being passed out. If you have questions, write them on. Write on them. Give them back to the usher. 
Successful politics is about sound bites and emotions. Specifically, what can Romney do in the next six months to successfully utilize sound bites and emotions? Could you please provide an example or two? Somehow I don't uh, associate emotions with. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he's got smart, smart, smart guys around him. Um, I, I, I think. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to uh, articulate this campaign. Um, I can't think of a more disastrous period since I've been around in American life, um, which is the direct result of the policies of Obama. Obama is a world-class liar. He makes Bill Clinton look like a Boy Scout. <laughs> we live in an age where every soundbite that he's ever given is on video. I expect to see great ads. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think Romney is not going to follow the game plan that I've outlined here. This has got to come from the, from the bottom up. It's got to come from the grassroots. Um, it's just not in his character. But, um, we'll see. Let's see how, how far he can go. I, I, I have to say that I think that uh, uh, the, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement is going to um, work for us in a big way in this election. Um, the Democrats are so out of touch with reality because they have, the press used to be a kind of referee that kind of keep people within uh, the realm of the real, but they have, you know, uh, well, Bernie Goldberg is very good on, on the slobbering love affair with Obama. Um, so they've lost their, their checks and balances. They don't, they don't even see it coming. I, I, I don't know, did you watch this? Uh, this woman on O'Reilly, MoveOn.org, has this campaign that uh, an illegal, to call somebody, to call somebody who's illegal, illegal, you're a racist. That, that's the totality, I mean, have you read 1984? That's what it's all about. That's, what it to that's a totalitarian mentality. You just can make words mean what you want them to mean. Um, anyway, so that's not a great answer, but, but I, I am so remote. Uh, from from Romney, I, I look. I everybody should go out and work for Romney. Um, we've got to get these people out of office. The, the, Obama is only the tip of a terrible iceberg. The whole White House is filled with communists who, who will betray us and are betraying us. Let's get them out. And then you know the battle. Conservatives hate politics. I should have said that. That's being a conservative. You just hate it. It's, it's nasty, uh, it, it's unethical, it's filled with low class arguments and low class people. Um, so conservatives always want a quick fix. They want a constitutional amendment. That's not gonna do anything. The Supreme Court decision, I mean, it, I would like us to win them, but you can't have a quick fix. It's a long battle. It's going to go on through lifetimes. But if you don't, if Bush had fought, if the Bush White House, and they kind of got designated hitters, had held the Democrats' feet to the fire in 2002 and 2003, we wouldn't be facing the problems we're facing today. So you've got to fight every step of the way. And not expect it to be over tomorrow. It won't be. How do Democrats victimize women? long prepared thing on this. <laughs> uh, you know, Obamacare, socialized medicine, is antithetical to people's health. You just have to look at England or Canada to see it. So women's issues 
according to the Democrats, are health issues. Um, this is destructive to women. I think de Democrats patronize women in the worst sort of way. Um, they have basically contempt for them, just the way they have contempt for blacks um, and, and other minorities. Because they, you know, it's like anti-Semites. Uh, they look at Jews, and Jews are like 0.02% of the world's population. But if you listen to an anti-Semite, uh, Jews rule the world. So what happened to all those Christians and atheists and Hindus? What are they, stupid? <laughs> it's the same thing with women. They always had contraceptives. We have to, everybody has to pay for women's contraceptives. Is that what it is? is it, or is it all contraceptives? I didn't even pay, pay close attention. What the heck is that about? Why is that a woman's health issue? If, if women want to have sex and don't want to have children when they have the sex, let them buy the contraceptives. I mean, no one would think of saying that's an anti-men men proposal. And why is that? It's because Democrats think that women are children and they have to be taken care of. Anyway. How could an uneducated, miseducated population possibly protect itself from the socialists? Well, the funny thing is that people get all kinds of, they don't, when I was a senior in Columbia, like six, 52 years ago, they put us seniors together with some alumni, and there was an old geezer there who was like my age now. <laughs> reform programs, and I went on and on to him, and you know, he was polite and listened, and then he said, he just dis disregarded everything I had said, and he, he said, you know, I learned everything that I know after I graduated from college. <laughs> <laughs> that made me furious, but he was absolutely right. But people learn in the real world, um, you know. I, you could go through a, a, you know, any women's studies course, you, a number of them that you want, and you, you go out and buy a gallon of gasoline, and it's five dollars, and maybe at least six dollars soon, you understand, um, and that teaches you what's, what's going on. I do think that if we let our educational system remain in the hands of the left forever, we're going to lose the country. But what I see, the, you know, don't forget, universities are very big institutions. So there's a lot of great things going on in them. Uh, you know, science, uh, business, and so forth. <coughs> Professional schools. And, um, it's just the liberal arts divisions. But the liberal arts division train political activists, political staffers, future politicians. And that's the problem. If middle class blacks lost 54% of their net worth, or $100 billion in the housing bus, why do they continue to vote for Democrats? Now look, again, this is the libertarians' problem, that you know, people aren't rational. <coughs> whoever, whoever thought that people were rational? The, I don't know, if you want, O'Reilly has a guy who goes out and asks people in the street about elections, about the government, Jay Leno has jaywalking. Stupidity is one of the largest and most important factors in human affairs. That nobody ever talks about. Uh, you know, the, the black leadership is totally bought. Um, they make lots of money. Um, uh, on very little uh, capital. Uh, it's not the best representatives of the black community in America are not sitting in Congress. I mean, it's true probably of every constituency, but it's extremely true. That, did anybody ever see the video? This was last, in the last year. It was a YouTube video of a, a black congressman in Georgia named, I think his name is Johnson. Yeah. 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 
and we were going to put 25,000 Marines on, uh, on Guam, was it? Some, some significant island. And then there was an admiral being quizzed, and this, he asked if the island might capsize. <laughs> now, you know, this wasn't a big thing because, you know, the press is totally in the pocket of the communist. I always say the Democratic Party is composed of communists and crooks. <laughs> basically, that's basically it. Why do the Jews continue to vote for the Democrats? Me? <laughs> Why do many Jews continue? <laughs> well, look, I, I um, actually, the little book I have back there, um, no, not that one. The black, the, oh, this lady has them here. This one. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's called The Point in Time. This is the kind of philosophical summation of my, um, my life's experience. So it's also about my dogs. It's about growing old. Um, but it, inside it, is a book, it's called The Search for Redemption in This Life and the Next. People, it's very hard to live thinking that we're all just going to disappear and that everything about us is going to be erased and everything about the world that we knew will be erased. And I start off with a, uh, a Roman philosopher, if you've seen the very conservative film of Gladiator. Marcus Aurelius was a, an emperor of Rome, but he was also a philosopher. Um, and he meditated, he was a Stoic, and he meditated on, he wrote a, a notes which are called the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. And it was about the fact that, um, you know, all the heroes of yesteryear, or of course he names people you would never, and I never heard of, uh, whole civilizations are gone without a trace. Um, and then he asked himself, if this is true, why, why do I continue living? And the only answer he can come up with is that he's a coward. <laughs> because if that's true, the only real decision is, you know, how to get out of here. <laughs> and uh, I, I think he's wrong about that. But then he comes up with an answer, and the answer is without any justification without saying that he had a revelation or anything. There's a God, and all the universe is one, actually it sounds it's a little bit new age, but it was enough uh, uh, in, in sync with religious beliefs that Christian monks rescued, his, actually rescued his work, because it's a precursor of, of Christian faith. So you really have, there's really two options. You, if you believe in a creator, uh, then you understand that we live, we see now through a glass darkly, and only after we're gone, face to face. So it, it will be sorted out. And that gives a person a, enough sense of meaning in their lives that they can go forward. But suppose you're an atheist, as most of those people on the left are. Suppose you're a secular Jew. I guess people are always asking me why, why are Jews so stupid about politics. But somebody once said Jews have the uh, economic profile of Episcopalians but vote like Puerto Ricans. <laughs> <laughs> if you are, <clears throat> if this world is all there is, you can't live with the sense that, that it's meaningless. It's very, it's very hard to go through day after day, and, and, and that, it doesn't add up. So these people, and this is what my book is about, seek a redemption in this life. They're going to change the world. They're going to, they're going, they're going to be present at a creation. In fact, they are going to take on the work of, of gods. And those of you who are familiar with the Bible and the story of Genesis know that that's exactly what Satan told Eve 
if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall be as God. That's every leftist. That's every leftist. And it's interesting that um, the serpent, that, well, the serpent is the original leftist, and as I... <laughs> Well, but it's not just I that think that. Saul Alinsky, who is Obama's mentor, and I, I, I point this out in that little pamphlet in the back, dedicated rules for radicals to Lucifer as the first rebel. I should finish on that, though. You Have you, will you directly offer your um, consultation to Mitt Rob? <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> they are, look, I, you know, wait, 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 wait. I wrote this little, in that same form, a little pamphlet called The Art of Political War, which, How to Beat the Democrats, is the sequel to. And it, it has an inscription on the front, a blur. It says, the perfect guide to winning on the political battlefield. Karl Rove. <laughs>